Well, welcome everyone. It's awesome to see the attendees number continue to go up. We are so thankful that you are joining us today. We know there are a lot of things you could be doing on your Wednesday morning at 9 a.m. or 10 a.m. or even 7 a.m. if you're on the Pacific uh, time zone. We're so grateful that you have joined us. I'm Holly Tate. I'm the Vice President of Business Development at Vanderblumen, where we help Christian institutions from colleges and universities to churches and nonprofits and Christian secondary schools with team building. So we help you hire the right people. And uh, we have Brian Jensen on our team, who's one of our executive search consultants and is my colleague. So I'm gonna hand it over to you in just a second. But we have gotten a lot of feedback on our panels that we've been doing specifically for education. And so we're grateful that you've joined us and we're excited to bring these esteemed leaders together today who are thinking about and um, facing the same challenges that you are in your seat. And so as we learn and grow together, I would love for you to put your comments um, and questions in the question panel. So you should see there at the bottom of your Zoom webinar panel, there is a Q&A section and a chat section. Feel free to put your questions there in the Q&A box. You'll be able to see each other's questions. So do know that, that if you ask a question, it might be viewable by everyone. Um, and uh, we'll, be, we'll be glad to dive into those questions today. Um, and also just some quick housekeeping. Um, we are going to be re recording this and then we're gonna be posting the replay on our website, reopeningschool.com. So reopeningschool.com. So if you have a friend that couldn't make it today or you wanna watch this later, um, we will have that available to you probably later today or tomorrow morning at reopeningschool.com. Well, without further ado, I'm going to turn off my video and hand it over to my colleague, Brian Jensen, who's going to share his story with you and moderate today's panel. So take it away, Brian. Well, good morning. And I am uh, just elated right now. Uh, Holly mentioned we've gathered esteemed leaders, which is true. Um, I just, it was fun because I pulled together my friends. These are my old friends. I love that we're talking about student development, which is where I spent uh, all of my Christian higher education career and have met uh, and spent a lot of time with these folks over the years as we uh, were on the front lines together and they are still on the front lines. And so I'm really excited uh, to have this conversation with them. Uh, I uh, am a consultant with Vanderblumen. Uh, I focus primarily on our education and nonprofit clients. Uh, I spent 15 years at CCCU campuses, uh, first at North Central University in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and then spent 12 years at Geneva College in Beaver Falls, Pennsylvania. Uh, the last uh, number of years there as the Vice President of Student Development. And so I've, I've lived my life in student uh, development and uh, enjoyed my time thoroughly. And so as we jump into this conversation, I want to mention a couple things. Uh, one, we are all still learning in this together. Um, I, I welcomed these friends into this conversation, uh, and we want to talk about uh, what we're experiencing on campuses. But I know that nobody has a silver bullet answer, right? Um, I was just talking with somebody yesterday, and it feels like the landscape changes every 10 days or so. Uh, and so even our planning and trying to figure out what we're doing in the future uh, can be thrown off a week from now. And so we're going we're gonna to talk about a few things as we think about student development on campus uh, now and, and thinking about towards the future in the fall. But we know things change and uh, we're all in this together. And we also want to be encouraging uh, as we've had these conversations over the last couple months. I think one of the things that has come to mind for me is that um, people coming together to just encourage one another is, is really helpful during this time. And so I hope that you are encouraged this morning and find it helpful as well. Um, so I am gonna let each of our panelists introduce themselves and share a little bit of encouragement. And then we'll jump into some questions that I have. And then please make sure you're submitting your questions because we wanna get to those as well. So, all right, I'm gonna let Sarah start and introduce herself. Thank you, Brian. It's so good to be with you all today. Um, my name is Sarah Visser. I serve as Vice President for Student Life at Calvin University in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And I am closing out my fifth year in this role. Prior to the role, I was a faculty member at Azusa Pacific University on the West Coast and also spent a number of years in student development work um, in non-faith affiliated education before that at the Claremont Colleges. 
Um, so when, when Brian asked us to share a word of encouragement, I was excited because a lot of the conversations I've been having with my team, um, and, and I think this will resonate with you all student development colleagues, a lot of the work that we do is we try to hold the tension of both grace and truth. And I think about um, student development theory, I think about the ways that students are growing and learning and often they're discovering that what they thought was either good or bad is often kind of a mix of both. And how do you hold those two things? Um, so I am rejoicing that all of this craziness has transpired um, both during the season of Lent and in the season of Eastertide. Um, and I find myself constantly going back to think about um, what does it mean to be, to feel as though we're wandering in the wilderness, to feel as though we're parched and not quite sure where our sustenance is coming from um, as we navigate this road, but also um, to be reminded again and again of resurrection hope in Jesus Christ. Um, so the, the words of Isaiah 43, 19 keep you know, going through my mind Behold, I'm doing a new thing. And I think those are powerful words for us as Christian leaders right now, that um, in the midst of everything being turned upside down, I believe that God is up to something. And I believe that we're invited to partner in that. So whether that's small things like, who would have thought we could acclimate resistant faculty to online technology as quickly as we did at Calvin? That's something that we're rejoicing in. Um, and who would have thought that, um, that students who perhaps had been reticent to ask for help now are reaching out in new ways and building connections. So I think that um, my prayer has been that we would have the eyes to see and that we would be seeking um, to live in attentive ways. So I hope that's encouraging to you as it has been to me that in the midst of what feels often burdensome, um, there's also some really redemptive things happening. And I just pray we don't miss that. Dr. William Washington uh, from Bethel University in Minnesota. Uh, I've been at Bethel for the last five years. Uh, prior to Bethel, I was at Trinity International University in various roles and positions. Unlike Sarah, I've not been in a barber's chair for the last eight weeks. And so my hair is, uh, let's just say, uh, in conflict with one another. Uh, but at any rate, uh, I uh, am thankful for the opportunity uh, to interact with all of you this morning. Uh, by way of uh, context, uh, when we began the 2019-20 school year, uh, we knew at Bethel that we were entering into a, a difficult time, that our enrollment uh, challenges uh, were necessitating, uh, that we make some hard choices. And I began to prepare uh, members of my division of leading in times of uncertainty. And that was pretty much the, the thing, that uh, though we were uncertain about what would happen, we were certain about God's providence. We were certain uh, that God would continue to lead us. And we were certain that we were called to serve students uh, with excellence, humility, and love. And who would have thought it uh, that we would have been uh, in a situation uh, like this? Uh, we are in our last week of classes uh, at Bethel, and this afternoon, I wrap up our last uh, staff meeting. But within that construct, the scripture uh, that we started at our student leadership retreat and embedded uh, what we were going to do for the remainder of the school year uh, was found in 2 Timothy uh, 1, verse 7. For the Lord did not give us a spirit of fear or timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. And so we're, I, I wanna encourage uh, my colleagues out there. God has given us power to endure this. Uh, he's given us love uh, to be uh, sensitive about brothers and sisters around us and how to care for them properly. And he's given us self-discipline to be strong, to finish the fight, to stay in the fight and run the fight that God has put in front of us on behalf of our students. So good morning. God bless you guys. Well, good morning. My name is Becky Starkenberg and I serve as Vice President for Student Life and Title IX Coordinator at Trinity Christian in Palos Heights. We're located just outside of Chicago. 
uh, in the southwest suburbs. And um, we've been out since May 2 of our spring semester, so we're fully into our summer semester online and gearing up for um, a board meeting later this week. So maybe we'll get a chance to talk a little bit more about that as time goes on. But I wanted to just share with you this morning that um, as we've been walking through this year together as a student life staff at Trinity, uh, one of the things that's really been powerful for us is the, the theme of God's steadfast love. And in November of last year, um, actually my, my own pastor from my church spoke at our chapel and talked about God's steadfast love and how um, kind of predominant of a theme that is in scripture. There's just so many times in throughout scripture that that God speaks of his loving kindness for us and his enduring love, his steadfast love. And so um, I think that as we've encountered that as student life people, we need that steadfast love because we get to sit in the front row a lot with students and with our community in crisis situations. And this time is no different, right? We get to be kind of in the front row responding to questions, um, walking alongside students as they're encountering the difficulty of dealing with family members who have COVID, who are dealing with family members who've lost work, um, who are you know encountering all kinds of challenges. And yet it's this kind of incredible privilege that we have in student life, and particularly I think at Christian institutions, to be right holding that space with our students. So um, I guess I wanna just remind us all of God's steadfast love for us and that he holds us and he holds us all together and just underscore what both Sarah and William have said that um, he is with us in this time. Greetings from Lookout Mountain, Georgia. Uh, my name is Brad Boyles. I'm the VP for Student Development and Dean of Students at Covenant College. We are located here in Georgia, the state where tattoo parlors and tanning salons are essential services. And so that's been a real <laughs> blessing to all here. We are about 15 minutes from downtown Chattanooga and I'm wrapping up year number 15 at Covenant. And like most of these folks cover my, I'm, I'm responsible for the areas outside the classroom. Like Becky, I am the Title IX coordinator. So it was a real gift from the Department of Ed to receive new guidance last week on top of everything else going on. So. Hurrah. I am a parent of a current rising junior here at Covenant, and I'm also a parent of a rising freshman. And so I think it's been really helpful to be viewing it through the lens of current student and incoming student, what we're going through here. Uh, by way of encouragement to you all, I would just say, no one knows what the heck they're doing right now. Take comfort in that, that we're all doing the very best that we can. We're learning on the fly. I, I saw someone attribute a quote to Lincoln recently where he was asked about his plan for winning the Civil War after the fact. And he said that there, there was no plan. They simply navigated from point to point. And I think that's uh, kind of where we are with the fuzziness of everything right now. So just, I think, take comfort that we're all trying to figure it out. I'm really thankful for Brian pulling us together and others, CCCU and others who've been pulling people together. We need to be talking to one another and learning from one another. Um, I would say by way of encouragement from scripture, I did a devotional with my team last month on Psalm 16. And it's one of David's Psalms of deliverance. He's on the run. He is seeking shelter. He's seeking refuge and he's doubting <clears throat> his shelter and his refuge. And I was connecting this back to the concept of our union with Christ compared to our communion with God and the the reality is our union with Christ is absolutely certain. It's unchanging. It does not rise and fall with our faith. What we've done or failed to do, it's the very root of our relationship and it, it's forever. It's unchanging, but our, our communion with God does change and vary day to day. It's impacted by our faith, our devotion, by what we choose to do or not to do. And so it's, I think it's so critical right now for us to remember this and remind ourselves of this at God's love for us in Jesus Christ does not change. The experience of that love can certainly vary, but the strength and the constancy of our shelter never changes, even if the certainty of it feels like it's changing hour to hour right now. And so we can easily fall into this trap of assessing the, the security of our union. Does, does God really love me on the strength of our communion? How am I doing today? 
how am I feeling? I think as you look at Psalm 16, you actually see David rehearsing the promises of God, reminding himself of what God has done for him, what God has provided. And by the time he gets to verse eight, he says, I've set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. And so I think that's just an encouragement for us not to neglect our time in the word, not to neglect prayer and the means of grace because Real joy, real comfort, I think, ultimately has to be devotional before it becomes emotional. You have to practice and rehearse and avail yourself of those means of grace, and you will believe it and become more certain in it. So that's just my encouragement to you all in that. And I would say by way of encouraging our teams right now, I think we've got to be thanking them daily for what they're doing. There's tremendous creativity going on right now that I'm in trying to encourage um, what we've had to pivot to and what we're thinking about for the fall. I tell folks that, you know, enforced limitations actually encourage creativity, that we innovate sometimes because we have to. And so it's been really incredible to see some of the steps people have taken and, and, and some, some real wins that we can celebrate in all this. Um, and, and then also just, I think the last thing I would say is uh, the most one of the most important things is to be honest with, with your team about your hope, about your doubt, um, that we, there's a lot of uncertainty right now. It's okay to be vulnerable about it. That's good. Thank you all for sharing that. And, and uh, there's a reason I wanted to start that way uh, because I think we need to continue. Some of you mentioned this. We need to continually be reminded of the truth in the scriptures, the certainty we have. I myself have been stuck in Psalm 46 for the last two months and and that God is uh, our refuge in an ever-present time of help, even though the mountains may slip into the sea. And it certainly feels like mountains are slipping into the sea. And, and there's all this uncertainty, but we rest in the promises of the scriptures. And uh, I want to I wanna start asking some specific questions now about what the conversations on your own campuses are looking like, specific to student development, um, outside of the classroom work, um, and as, as Brett mentioned, we, nobody knows what we're doing. Um, not many of you took a class in grad school on navigating a global pandemic. And so this is new territory for everybody. And so I, I don't think anybody would claim to have a silver bullet answer or the, the concrete plan for moving forward. But as we keep pulling uh, people together to have these conversations, I think they're helpful. And so we've gone through now a couple months of, of uh, damage control and crisis response and trying to figure out, uh, I think early on, when are we gonna come back this spring? And then quickly we realized that wasn't gonna happen. Um, and so now we're starting to think, what are, what are the summer months looking like? What is the fall semester gonna be like? And those plans are probably all over the map. So I've asked everybody to share just some brief thoughts as we get into this conversation on what are, what are contingency plans looking like um, are you, and maybe even just start by how have you done contingency planning and what are those conversations looking like as you now think towards basically the 2020, 2021 academic year? So I'm gonna let Brad start by sharing just some general thoughts on contingency planning on his campus. Sure. So I, I serve as the chair of our emergency response team and so was part of obviously that decision to close and then the obviously the fallout of that decision and that's pivoted now to a, a new team that we're it's the same people. We're, we're calling it the uh, COVID reopening team or COVID recovery team. Um, for me, with, when, with, with leading a group, I think it's helpful to come up with a, a word picture. It's just the way I operate. And so I've come up with this concept of a three-legged stool. And the question was, what do we have to be able to do to, with, in, in all integrity, reopen in the fall? And if you look at it that way, it, it basically reduced down to three different legs of a stool. You, had to, you have to be able to teach. I mean, we are an institution of higher education. You have to be able to host. This is a residential college and you have to be able to protect. And so from that created three different teams to teach them, host them and protect them teams made up of committee members from the whole meeting as groups. And so I meet with the chairs of each of those teams, but you could think, I mean, it was very obvious, the teaching folks are gonna be faculty, tech services, the records and registrars folks in terms of figuring out how do we teach in this and what are the different plans we have to make. 
host is, you know, when you think about being a host, how do we, how do we house? How do we feed these students? How do we uh, arrange, um, you know, uh, events, chapels, athletics, uh, the various events that we have. And then the protect them group obviously comes down to what are the measures that we feel we have to have in place and developing a plan going forward. And so um, that's, that's the big picture. I don't know how much detail you want to go in. I could talk about each and every one of those things, but I'll turn it back over to you. That's great. I think just getting some uh, even initial thinking of how people are starting to to go about planning is really helpful. So Becky, what have you been doing on your campus? Yeah, yeah, I really appreciate what you've had to say, Brad, about that. And I think it ties in, you know, one of the things I've been thinking about is how important it is for us not to be siloed during this time. And um, as we finished out, so we sent students home March 12, and we really made the tough decision at that point to have them move out completely. So all of our students moved all of their belongings home. It was um, pretty stressful at the time, to be honest, but um, I think in hindsight, we felt like it was the right thing to do. Um, and then now we're in, we're in Illinois. So we're still in a space, as you can see from my lovely uh, corner office in the basement behind me, uh, we're still working from home. So Brad, I can tell you look like you're in your office um, back on campus, which I'm really jealous about that. But um, but we're still in Illinois working from home for sure until the end of May. In Chicago in particular, we're in a zone within the state of Illinois where it's not really clear what's gonna happen at the end of May, whether we'll still be working from home. I know some of you who are listening to this are in California where there's been some really significant news that's just come out in the last few days. So I'm feeling for you too and resonating with what you must be going through in California. Um, and, you know, so we're really trying to pay attention to what our state leaders are saying and also plan for the fall. So our president just um, announced that we are hoping to regather on campus in the fall uh, if conditions allow. And our, our groups of folk who are working on planning for the fall really represent, you know, that cross-disciplinary perspective. We, too, have an emergency response team. Um, that I chair and we, we've shifted it to a, we call it the COVID impact planning group. So very similar type of uh, shift that Covenant made and it uh, has voices from different parts of the campus. And so I think um, one thing that I've found is all of the kind of territorialism that can come up in higher ed is completely out the window at this point and we're all needing to work together. So I spend a lot of time on, on Teams or on Zoom with our provost talking about how we can work together. And campuses are really unbelievably intricate and complex places. And so the minute you start messing with one piece, all of the other pieces come together and, and kind of impact that piece. So I think for all of us at all levels of the institution, you know, all the way from your frontline residence life staff to your president, everyone needs to be thinking across the institution and not just within their own space, which can be very daunting at times. I think when um, my staff has looked at our kind of, we have an assembled, just very practically, we have a um, Excel document that we're, we're dumping all of our questions into about what to do, you know, and we, and so I have a shared box folder open and it's like, if you have a question about how we're going to handle something, dump it into the Excel and we're going to funnel that to one of our groups. And it's daunting to read that list of questions. It really is because this is like a, a massive shift that we're having to think about to make sure all of those pieces are in place. Um, but I do think, you know, one of the things I, I value about the people on this call and those of you who are listening, I've seen some of the names of the people who have come up is that we have a lot of wisdom that we can share across institutions too. So I hope we continue to do that. Good. Yes. Uh, well, uh, our initial stay-at-home order uh, by our governor uh, was established for May 4th, uh, then it was extended to May uh, 18th, uh, and he has described uh, how we would uh, possibly be reopening as a dial, uh, not a switch. And so we've kind of taken uh, that particular uh, verbiage and language and applied it uh, to our setting as well. Uh, we have been encouraged uh, to uh, stay at home, which I am. Uh, so Brad, you the man, 
uh, by being able to get back on your campus, uh, but we are uh, required uh, to continue to stay at home until May 31st. Um, with that said, uh, we don't know with certainty what the fall will be looking like, but we are actively preparing scenarios to allow us to resume face-to-face -face, uh, in the fall. Uh, and so with that vein, in terms of moving the dial, uh, we've already developed a phased approach for segments of our employees uh, to return to campus. So there'll be a group that will be coming back in, in June and then in July and then consequently in August uh, if we're able uh, to maintain uh, our start date. Uh, we've been grateful uh, for the guidance we've received from the CDC, the Minnesota Department of Health, uh, other institutions uh, within uh, Minnesota, and other colleagues at, at private colleges and universities uh, to help us maximize uh, that potential. Like Brad and, and Becky, we've established some working groups uh, at Bethel to really look at uh, some of the major aspects of what a face-to-face, -face, a successful face-to-face -face, uh, would look like. And so uh, in that vein, we've developed plans for density and social distancing throughout the campus, including classrooms, residence halls, chapel, athletics, large social events. How can we successfully uh, and safely uh, have those events take place, maintaining an element of community that really fostered uh, who our, our institution is, uh, but to continue uh, to perpetuate safety. Uh, we're preparing virtual learning environments uh, that give us flexibility to adapt to face-to-face -face scenarios. And for example, it could be that you can have a classroom with students in a classroom, but a faculty member, uh, because of uh, situations and circumstances, maybe they still have kids at home, they're not able to teach, so now they're virtual and, and the students are, are there uh, face to face. Uh, but just looking at uh, multiple ways in which uh, we can navigate that and then ensuring that we have our health and safety measures uh, in place uh, to include uh, the eventuality of uh, someone becoming ill. And so self-isolation, uh, what does that look like? What are some of the uh, residence halls uh, uh, conduct issues that we may need to be uh, considering, uh, cleaning schedules and so on and so forth. So uh, we decided uh, to, to put the stake in the ground, if you will, and say, uh, Lord willing, uh, we're going to go with face-to-face, -face, but we're going to do it with a careful dialed approach in concert uh, with our, our state and local governments uh, to ensure that we do it right. Sarah? Oh, I think Sarah's frozen. <laughs> or she's sitting very still. Um, <laughs> while we wait for Sarah to jump back in, I, I, I want to follow up with the contingency planning question specific to residential colleges, because all of you are at residential colleges. Uh, probably almost everybody on this webinar is at a residential college. Are you thinking in your contingency planning about uh, a couple things? One, does your contingency planning include what if we uh, get to a point where we think we can do class on campus face to face? Do we want to go into that? And what ha do we have contingency plans if this resurfaces and we have to close again in the middle of the fall semester, similar to the way we did the spring? Or are we thinking it's better to start on uh, distance learning and then in the middle of the semester, if we can, get to campus? That's a crazy contingency plan. Uh, second part of that is, does anybody have a, a drop dead date? You know, William, you're talking about the dial. We've got some phases. Does anybody have just a date where they're saying, if we can't decide by, you know, July X, uh, we're not going to go back face to face? Has anybody had those conversations on their campus? Yeah, I can jump in just um, from a couple perspectives. One is, um, so we're a really small institution. So it, even compared, I think, to the others on this call, we're probably the smallest. 
and we have a small residential population and all of our residence halls are suite style. We have no community bathrooms. So we have been really thinking about the physical structure of our space and how that might allow us to bring students back and treat them sort of as family units um, in that suite style room. So I think for us that makes a unique kind of scenario and we also have quite a few commuters. So um, of our overall student population, including our adult and grad, the majority of our students commute back and forth to campus. So it might allow us then, I think to your second point, Ryan, to do a little bit more of that toggling back and forth between what everyone's referring to as a hybrid approach. Um, I saw in uh, inside higher ed, Perry Glanzer from Baylor just put an article out who's one of our, all of our kind of wise voices to many of us on this call. Um, Perry wrote about proposing maybe even uh, changes to the academic calendar. And I know that um, our provost office and academic offices are talking about the possibility of adjusting um, to block scheduling or you know, maybe a shift to the academic calendar, which seems um, seems like an enormous undertaking. I think larger institutions are also thinking about changes to the academic calendar. So um, I think that would be an area for sure that folks in Christian higher ed could talk about, share ideas about if our academic calendars, calendars are shifting. Um, so I think that the beginning, Adjusting the beginning is one possibility. Adjusting the end of the semester might be another possibility. The other thing I'd say about a drop dead date for Trinity is we're an NAIA institution for athletics. And the NAIA has said that July 1, they'll offer a word to their institutions about athletic competition. And I do think that's gonna have an impact on NAIA institutions for sure. And so we're kind of holding July 1 as a date that we're gonna have some more information. And then perhaps in July, we might be able to, you know, quickly pivot towards some decisions. Um, and, you know, the last thing I'll say, and maybe others would wanna comment on this too, is that, you know, our institutions, especially those of us maybe who are on the smaller size, can perhaps pivot more quickly. So we, we feel like we've got more time. Uh, we're kind of like a tiny little boat, not a large cruise ship. And so we can quickly turn that boat uh, and get our staff and faculty uh, moving in a different direction and our students as well. So right now it's probably for us more about putting the mechanisms in place, the communication tools and all of that. So when we need to pivot, we're able to do that quickly. Getting, getting orders, I know, uh, the other thing I'd add maybe to that is just the practical side of things. Folks are talking about things like um, temperature taking and testing and all of these things, like how do you get all of that equipment in place? Um, it's tough for colleges to come by a lot of that uh, supply right now. So we're, we're trying to do that back end work, I think now, so that when we do make a, a shift in July, which I anticipate we'll have some announcements to make and some shifts to make that we're ready to do that. So I'd be curious, honestly, myself about how either William or Brad are thinking about that. Well, I'll chime in. Uh, you used two operative words, Becky, that uh, definitely shaping our thinking at Bethel uh, time and the gift of it, as well as being agile. And I think as we develop the multiple scenarios we have forward, and we just have to hold those things in, in tension. Uh, we're waiting uh, again for some instructions and directives uh, from uh, our state and local gov government officials about, okay, what does face-to-face -face look like and social distancing and, and the density in our residence halls. I mean, you know, we have uh, the capacity to have over uh, 1,900 students on campus, and if we went to singles, that would reduce it to 940 in terms of occupancy. And so uh, that would have a, an adverse effect uh, on our bottom line, but yet our bottom line does not supersede what's in the best interest of our students and, and the safety uh, uh, of our, our community. And so, uh, so this scenario planning that we're in just has various uh, uh, channels, uh, tributaries, uh, to help us navigate it successfully. Uh, I would say personally, uh, it would be my hope that we would not have a start and stop uh, like we had uh, uh, in the spring. Uh, it was just so devastating uh, for our families and our students. 
especially for our seniors uh, in a blink of an eye to you know have to pack up their personal belongings and, and leave and, and so we want to make sure that as we're looking at the curve uh, uh, in the state of Minnesota where approximately 86 percent of our students derive from uh, that we're able uh, to, to navigate that properly so uh, being agile and having time as a friend uh, is certainly some things that we hope uh, would bode well for us in our planning. Yeah. Brad, anything to offer? Yeah, I think communication is a, a huge piece of this. So you asked the question of drop dead date. I think um, constant communication is going to be the key. There is going to come a point where you say we've got to let them know just so they can make alternative plans. And so we've played with this idea of one month out, but that's, that's not, you know, uh, in, in ink by any stretch. And we are dealing with athletics, as Becky mentioned, which is a huge player, huge driver in this. I appreciated William's language of a stake in the ground, and I think that's really important in your planning. And so my encouragement to everyone who's doing planning is figure out what your stakes are. One of ours is just the concept of risk stratification and the realization that not everybody's impacted in the same way by this virus. And so we, we have a primary goal of protecting the most vulnerable people on our campus, knowing who they are and how to do that. And so you've got to figure out is if that's your primary driver, how are we going to do that well? At the same time, you're, 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 there's a risk tolerance here that you've got to have as an institution recognizing what your limitations are. And honestly, you know, what, what facsimile of, of your institution will students and families tolerate? If it's a very, hopefully a close approximation or if it's just, um, it, it, or not, you're gonna run into something there and so, I would say what can be helpful in all this is making sure you've got good relationships with local, your public health department, with your hospitals, your, your, your primary care providers. You've gotta be tracking that because that helps you know just what capacity they have in, in the event you need to send people that direction. So be, be working on those relationships for sure. The, the screening versus testing question keeps coming up a lot. We don't know the availability of testing, but there are screening questions you can ask. You can expect folks to take temperature, whether you can actually enforce that or not is another thing. Becky brought up just the supply chain right now. There's a, it's, it's strained uh, tremendously from cleaning supplies to technology to masks and, and temperature. I, I see no reason why you wouldn't tell students you need to bring 10 masks and a thermometer and there are expectations you have. And I think communicating the expectations to the student are really important because <clears throat> even now they have to be figuring out this isn't just about me, it's how do I care for the most vulnerable among us. And so framing it in that way can hopefully help students understand that our call as believers to die to ourself, um, to lose for the sake of Christ is sometimes I, I do what I'm not comfortable with or I just don't wanna do because I care about the people in the community and so keeping that in front of us uh, would, would be important as well. Good. You know, I just want to add to that, Brad, like just, you know, developmentally, we know, and those of us in student development know, who've worked in student development, that students are at multiple different places in life. And Sarah's back. Welcome back, Sarah. Um, uh, where, you know, students are at well, multiple places in their maturity and their ability to understand that they live in a community and that part of living in a community is not just caring about self, but it's caring about others. It's about loving neighbor. And I feel like the Christian story has a lot to offer us in how we can talk about that in community in this time. Um, but that is going to press us to help our students to not just think consumeristically about higher education. It's not just that we're offering a product to them that is cleaned and sanitized, but they're part of a community, right? That they have to kind of enter into that community and agree to be people within the community that uh, live according to certain principles. I mean, we've already have that, but I guess those principles maybe are shifting for us. And so, um, or they're coming into sharper focus. I'm not quite sure yet, but I think as, as we work on this project together as Christian institutions, 
you know, I think in future conversations with our CCCU colleagues, like this is something that I think we're all gonna have to wrestle with together and to think about how do we invite people in rather than um, feel like we're offering people a sort of, we can't be perfect. We can't offer a perfectly clean, risk-free product. Um, and that's not what we ever have set out to do in these higher ed institutions, particularly Christian institutions. We're, we're about being formed and shaped in Christ in community. So what does that look like uh, in light of COVID, I think is maybe the question we have to be thinking about together. Yeah, that's good. I wanna give Sarah a chance to jump in. Uh, she's returned to us. Uh, and um, we've been talking about, you know, still contingency planning, which I wanted to let you uh, share your thoughts. We've been talking a little bit about uh, residential campuses and how we're thinking about bringing students back to campus. And then, uh, so your thoughts on that, Sarah, would be wonderful. And then specifically what I wanna, I wanna ask, and I'll let Sarah then take this first, how is, you know, tied into this is projections, right? So what are campuses doing to project any sort of retention numbers. Um, that's always difficult for us, but in the midst of this, even more so. So Sarah, I'm gonna let you start wherever you want to there and, and uh, share your insights. Great, well, thank you, I apologize. I'm not quite sure what happened, but you know, that's kind of how I feel about this whole year. So <laughs> um, I'll, I'll jump in. I think I was just posed three different questions, but let me back up a little bit and tell you more about what Calvin is doing um, in terms or has been doing throughout this whole COVID pandemic. Um, not unlike my colleagues, we had established kind of an emergency response team. Um, you know, one of the things I think has been interesting at Calvin is the way that technology has facilitated our cross-divisional partnership or even the de-siloization that Becky was referencing. Um, so at Calvin, we had adopted um, Microsoft Office 365 a couple of years ago, but we were just on the verge of really experimenting and rolling with Teams, which is, is one of their newer products. And um, so we made the decision as an emergency team that we were gonna use that as the platform. And what's been really interesting about that is that it's facilitated this cross-divisional um, sharing and instant connection. Um, and, and at the time when we started using it back in January, um, you know, there were, there were maybe 10 of us who were using it and then that quickly expanded to the point where we had a pandemic response team that included 14 different subcommittees. Um, and they were on all different aspects of community and campus life. So, um, you know, we had a safety committee. Well, it wasn't just campus safety and environmental health and safety. It was cross-divisional reps um, from across the university that were contributing into that. And so, you know, I'd, I'd echo what I heard Becky say earlier about the opportunity to really think outside of just functional areas and to begin to think about how the decisions and the responses that we're making impact operations across the whole university. Um, so we too have begun shifting away from just reactive crisis management into proactive, what's next, how are we thinking about the future. And I really like what Brad shared about the three-legged stool. You know, we, we've been using lots of different analogies, um, but I think one of the guiding questions for us has been, um, what would it take to do what we believe needs to be done? And, you know, as, as leaders, I think we're used to people coming to us with kind of a, help me solve this, what do you want me to do? Tell me, tell me what's okay to do and I'll do it. Um, and so we've spent quite a bit of time as a leadership team trying to help people pivot, not just into these new realities and new normals, but actually to pivot even the way they're thinking about their work. Um, what that looks like practically is, is, you know, me saying to them, I know you're asking questions about what are we going to be allowed to do? What I'd like you to think through is what's the worst case scenario? And in that worst case scenario, what would it take for us to do what it is we want to do and what we feel called to do missionally. And I think that has really transformed the conversation. Um, it's, it's, no, it's not so much focused on what are we gonna be allowed to do as it is, here's what we're gonna attempt to do and here's how we're gonna try to set it up so that we're in uh, the best possible place to be able to do that. So one practical example of that is um, we've been working really, really closely with our local health authorities. And um, like others have mentioned, we've benefited from the guidance, whether that's CDC or the health departments in our local area. Um, but we think it's also really important to be part of crafting their understanding of what higher education is. 
Um, so over the last week or so, Calvin has been very involved with other independent colleges and universities in the state of Michigan. Um, and the goal has been to craft a guidance document that we actually craft and deliver to the governor um, in the hopes that that will give them a sense of here's how we think we can do this and we're you know collaborating with local health authorities what i'm seeing is that the local health authorities are grateful because they, it gives them tangible problems to solve and it gives them a sense of um, who their partners on campuses are in trying to solve those things so um, when I was able to tune back in, I heard the very last thread of what Becky was saying about um, how do we enlist, you know, everybody in the business of understanding that there is no certainty. Um, what people seek right now is certainty. We can't give certainty, but we can give clarity. Um, so a lot of our work has been focused on what are the areas where we can, where we have clarity and how can we clearly communicate in those areas, um, how can we move toward tangible and tactical strategies to get, um, you know, to get back on campus in the fall, because that is our strong, strong bias and hope is that we intend to be fully back to the extent that um, that we're permitted and can demonstrate we're able to do so. Um, and also kind of the communal aspect of it. How do you help people share the load of that? And so not just be looking to leaders for, um, you know, give me the answers, who wise ones, um, because like Brad said, all of us are trying to figure out how to get from point A to B to C. None of us have a, a you know, kind of a perfect picture in mind of, of exactly how we're going to get there or what that looks like. Um, so our, our planning and scenario planning has tried to account for all of the what ifs, um, but really has tried to focus on the thens of that. If this, then this. Um, so that we could more quickly than, or maybe more, uh, maybe less uh, crazily than it felt like this semester, we could pivot to those different scenarios and we could scale up what we need to scale up when the time comes for that. Um, I heard you ask a question about projecting and how do you even begin to think about what student retention will look like? And that's been a good question for us over the last week or so. We obviously have a lot of the institutional indicators that we've counted on in the past, right? So Calvin is still in session. Uh, this is our last week of classes and we'll have exam week next week. Um, that means that just a week or two ago, our students went through their spring advising and registering for fall courses and summer courses. Um, so part of what we're doing is looking at that data and trying to see is there any early indication of shifts there in terms of who's engaged, who's not engaged. The other thing we've done, um, or, or we're actually rolling out this week, is uh, a student survey. And we're doing that both under the guise of, um, we want some feedback on how this semester has gone for you, what we could do better in terms of online distance um, virtual education, as well as, um, you know, what are some of the questions you're asking? And I think what we're trying to glean from that is both ways to fine tune our approaches, whether that's curricular or, or co-curricular, but it also is giving us a sense of um, the questions people are asking and the, maybe the fears and anxieties that they have so that we can walk toward those as we're thinking about our fall contingency planning. Another thing that we're toying with this week, and maybe this is just a, something, a consideration for campuses, as um, you know, part of our uh, room and board refund approach was to say, we're not gonna do that for a couple of months so that we can get our bearings and figure everything out. Well, we're nearing the time where we're about ready to grant uh, the, the credits and we had issued a refund. Um, it also, uh, we're coming up on the time when we're able to begin to disperse um, the federal funding that we had received um, for our students that was based on um, levels of need and such. So part of what we've talked about is hmm, maybe there's a strategy in actually using things like class registrations and even room draw residential placements, which we have that data now, we've gone through that cycle, and um, preparing tuition and room and board bills earlier than we normally would. Now, some people would say, why would you bill people <laughs> in June when everything's up in the air? Well, we're wondering if the combination of being able to issue um, the refund right around the time when we issue the, the um, bill will encourage people to think about multiple pathways, right? To think that, oh, perhaps I could utilize this refund um, and put that toward next year. Um, so, you know, we're, we're looking at all those kinds of things, trying to assess what students and families are worried about, what they're thinking about, and really trying to work toward um, 
maintaining maximum flexibility. The only other thing I'd say is Calvin launched um, what we call Unconditionally Calvin, and you can find that on our website, but it was basically messaging. Um, we, you know, along that theme of we can't offer certainty, we can't say for sure you will be back here in the fall and it'll be just what it always was and what you dreamed. But what we can do is um, commit to some things. We can commit to who we are as a faith formative community. We can commit to academic progress and maintaining that. We can commit to systems of support and resources. We can commit to things like flexibility. Um, so we, it was important to us to establish some principles and even some parameters and to send a strong message that this is what we're committed to. And I would say that then guides a lot of our um, strategic and scenario planning. Um, because if we say, hey, we're committed to your academic progress, well, then that means that we need to have flexible options. Maybe we have different start dates. Maybe we have different entree points throughout fall semester. Um, maybe we look at both online and face-to-face -face options so that as students need to stop in or stop out, there's flexibility there. So I think, again, finding ways to connect to your mission and to communicate with clarity even when you don't have certainty. Yeah, that's really good. Thank you. And I'm, I, uh, one, somebody just asked, uh, Sarah, if that collaborative document will be a public document when it's done that you're submitting to the government? Yes, yep, it will be. I believe it'll probably go to print in the next uh, week or two. So once I have that, I'd be happy to share with Holly and Brian and, and perhaps they could share it as well. It, it'll be Michigan focused, of course, but sure. the goal was to make it general enough that there are um, principles that could be transferable. Awesome. Hey, I want to, we've got some questions coming in and I definitely want to get to those. Um, and of course, when I do things like this, I've got 50 of my own questions that we're not going to get to, of course, which we knew because there's just so much wisdom to be shared. And I hope you're learning from everybody here on the call. Does anybody, um, Sarah sh shared some really great insights on re retention projections and, and even just what they're trying to do now. Anybody else have anything there before we jump into some other questions? The yeah, only Brian, thing I, I'll oh, speak, go ahead, Brian. Yeah, go ahead, William. I'll speak to uh, uh, retention. Uh, our students registered for the uh, fall uh, in April. Uh, very strong numbers. We continue to see very strong numbers. Uh, they want to get back. And uh, we all know that depending upon what we do or don't do, uh, those retention numbers will be uh, significantly impacted. So uh, we know our students want to be back in, in community, but we want to ensure that we do it in the right way, safe way, uh, proactive way as well. Yeah, the only thing I would add is we, like Sarah, uh, did a survey of our students and asked for, uh, one of the questions had to do with sort of their top um, concerns and they could select, you know, check all that apply. And in our response, uh, Missing Trinity was their number one. Uh, concern about being away, uh, but really close behind that, and that was in like the 77% of students responded, was anxiety, uh, which I also think is, you know, we've been talking about student anxiety for a long time before COVID, and so just thinking about how we're going to respond to our students' anxiety, and then we did have of our respondents, about a quarter of our respondents had had some sort of family member who had uh, had a reduction in work. So that financial piece uh, where I think all of our institutions are talking about and, and working on the both that we need continued money from the federal government, we need support from our states, but we also need our donors to step up and support us and support our students. So um, I think just, I would just encourage you as other institutions to survey students and it's, it's just uh, helpful for us. It's been helpful for our advancement team to have that information to go out to donors and say, this is what's on the mind of Trinity students. And so um, it's really practical way to get, get that, that data from students to, in the hands of the people who can actually help and make a difference. Good. I, would, I would just add to that. I mean, this disease and its response to flatten the curve uh, hits at the very core of what we're about. And so there's these challenges to the fact that we celebrate this in-person residential shared life education and so I share these numbers with optimism that our pre-registration numbers are strong where they've been the last five years. We're planning for a 5% decrease just for budgeting purposes, recognizing the challenges some may have. But the reality is if we are fully online, the appetite for 
our education will diminish. I mean, I think in a very big way. Both of my sons have said they don't, they, they'll take a gap year. And that's a testimony to how rich the experience is that you only get four years of it. You don't want to give up even a semester or, or a year of that. And I think our athletes will have that same concern if we're not allowed to have athletics. And so I think we're holding loosely to a lot of these numbers. Yeah, that's good. We have a few minutes left and I wanna try and get a couple of these answered. So I'm gonna just ask one or two of you to respond and I'll let Brad start with, uh, you know, chapel looks different on all of our campuses, but it is a staple uh, on CCCU campuses. Um, what are other colleges doing to navigate plans for continuing chapel? And I'm, I'm assuming this is for the fall. Yeah, so um, I, I've encouraged my folks to use the same type of creativity that they use to pivot to, to move forward in this new, whatever this new normal is. And it's not that you're trying to retrofit what you did perfectly into virtual or, or, or modification. You gotta ask the question, what is the goal? of why we do these things and are there other ways, other pathways to get there. Chapel is the hardest, one of the hardest, athletics and chapel are some of the hardest ones for us right now. At my church, I'm on the session and we're making a plan and right now you can choose to have people in family groups and the principle is take your square footage and divide it by 144 and that gives you a six foot spacing in all directions and so you could situate family units in a church sanctuary uh, according to that number. So we're talking about what's our family unit at the college? Is that an entire hall? Is it a suite? Is it, is it a room? And then are there ways to, to, to situate folks safely? Um, but you're asking the question at this point that we don't have answers to. What, what will the government allow in terms of maximum capacity in any, any room? We're asking questions about what can we do outside more than we ever have before. We have pretty beautiful weather here in, in Northwest Georgia. Uh, throughout most of the fall and so um, we're thinking about that and if you can't are there ways to to, to do more bite-sized smaller group pieces um, for discipleship purposes okay um, i'm going to toss this one to sarah uh, because of some of her background any encouragement for those of us that work at public state universities how can we respond to the crisis as christians in a secular context Oh, that's just a light softball question. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, um, I'm going to give you kind of a philosophical approach and then I'm going to give you maybe a, a little bit more um, boots on the ground practical approach. So philosophically, um, I'd go back to what I shared at the very beginning of the webinar. Um, what does it mean to live as people of hope and to see possibility? I think that, I don't think it's um, a trait and a, a life um, a life skill that applies only to Christians, but I think it's it's in our DNA. It's it's who we were made to be um, as kingdom bearers. So I do think um, part of what we can do is to help people see the possibility in it and to believe that there there's a new way moving forward. Um, boots on the ground, you know. I think what um, what we're seeing, at least in the state of Michigan, is that there are some real hurdles to large public institutions because of their size. Um, and the other piece to that is that sometimes they don't have as much emphasis on um, the formational community aspects that often private residential campuses do. So I think that part of what you can bring is a sense of how do we build smaller pods. I like the way that that, that was just used. Kind of what's the family pod? What's the unit? I've seen that, that language creep up in some guidance documents. Um, how do we create smaller neighborhoods, communities within these public, if they're large institutions, um, to, to help people begin to think through what's manageable? Um, it's ultimately going to come down to both prevention and to the ability to mitigate the risk of spread, the ability to contact trace, the ability to test, those kinds of things. Um, so what are the partnerships that can be formed among institutions with the local government and local health authorities? Um, I really think that this is an opportunity for um, private Christian higher education to offer some examples and to speak into that. But we're going to need partners. So, you know, we're partnering with um, several of the public institutions in Grand Rapids to think through you know, things like testing and um, contact tracing and what are you doing and how could we do that and what what opportunities might we have to share resources, um, whether that's academic resources or student services kind of resources. So I think we need each other. 
Um, and I think we need Christian leaders um, in all contexts to be kind of reorienting one another toward hope in this time. That's really good. All right, William and Becky, I'm going to let you uh, each take a minute and answer this, this same question, uh, and then we'll wrap up. But I, I'm interested in the, when you look at the leaders on your campus that have risen to the occasion uh, with innovation, they've pivoted, they're agile, what, what, are you, what sticks out to you on your team? Who are you seeing rise to the top? What are their traits and who's leading really well right now? You know, I think I'll just say empathy. I think people who are able to look at another person or a community of people, whether that be students or faculty or staff, and understand where those folks are coming from and seek to meet a need that fits our mission, um, whether that need has to be met in a completely new way. And yes, all of the agility and the adaptability is there, but the, the ability for a leader to have empathy, I think, has come through um, as a really important trait that I've seen. Brian, uh, yesterday I was on a call with student leaders and with our outgoing retiring president, Jay Barnes, and uh, he initially talked about his first year being 2008, and we all know what 2008 was for uh, our country and for higher education, uh, and now his last year uh, is being uh, determined by COVID-19. And so looking at those two bookends and for him to encourage all of us uh, to continue to be uh, hopeful uh, in what God has called us to do, but also uh, to lead as, as a calling. And uh, no matter how difficult the circumstances may be, uh, if God has called you to do a certain thing and to be a certain type of person, He'll give you the ability and power to accomplish uh, that task. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be challenging, 2008, 2019. But when you're called to do something, God doesn't abandon you. And uh, that's uh, my word for the day on that question. That is, that is a great word and a great word to end on. I, uh, I know Holly's going to wrap up here, but I am so thankful uh, to my friends. You've each had an impact on my life and thankful to the wisdom you just shared. I think we all learned from each other. We're going to continue learning from one another as we continue through this, uh, however long it goes. Um, and we can rest in the promises of the scripture that I'm so thankful for. So deep uh, appreciation for you all for joining us today. Thank you. Absolutely. I echo that. I learned so much just watching and hearing from each of you today. And thank you so much for everyone who submitted questions. I love seeing where all of us are joining from today. It's just amazing to see the network from around the country coming together. Um, in the chat area, I put the links to Dr. Sarah Visser and Brian Jensen's book, where it's a fitting for right now because it's literally called Reimagining the Student Experience. And they'll need to write another one um, a, a year from now or two years from now. Um, but oh, look, yeah, there Brad. you go. There's Brad. <laughs> so definitely check that out. And then um, I also put the links to our uh, schoolcovid19.com and reopening school dot com where we have all of our resources we'll post the link to this replay here we'll also email for each of you that are on we'll email out the replay link i want to say a quick prayer before we go today dear lord thank you so much for all of the institutional leaders that you've brought together on this panel and on this webinar today we're so grateful for the calling that you've placed on their lives lord we pray peace and wisdom over them right now as each of the people on this webinar are making critical decisions in a time of uncertainty and anxiety. So we pray for discernment and wisdom that can only come from you, Lord. And we know that you're going to do great things through this terrible and fearful time, Lord. And so we rely on you and we trust in your sovereignty. And in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much, everyone. We Amen. hope you have a wonderful day, and we will see you again next time at our next Vanderbilt Network Live event.